Hey guys, it's Ken Finnan from Capital Advantage Tutoring, and I'm back for Chapter 3, I'm guessing Part 2, I think that's what it is. So if you want to pass the SIE exam, the Series 7 exam, the Series 6 exam, any of the FINRA exams, you need to read the book. And what I'm trying to do is get through the whole book, the whole SIE book, and then I'll move on, hopefully to the top off, but you guys will be done by then. So... Um, let's talk about the rights of being a common stockholder. So I kind of went over it at the end. I kind of rushed through to the end, so I'm going to do a little bit more. By the way, I did figure out that since I, I, I thought about buying a better camera with better, like, graphics or whatever it was, but I figured out I'm much better looking in a crappy camera. Blurry is blurry. Okay, so now, the rights of a common stockholder. So one, you have the right to inspection. That just means you get to look at the books and records like the 10Q quarterly report, not audited. 10K, the annual report, audited. It's not as big a deal now because they you can just get it online. But in the olden days, in the beginning of the Internet in the 30s, you couldn't get one unless you were a shareholder. So they had to mail it to you. So you would get it. At, that's one of your rights. You can't sit there and look at the book. You can't look at, like, the board meeting minutes or anything. But you have a right to look at the financials and stuff. But... Pretty much anyone can see that now. You have the right to vote. That's always a great one. So we have the right to vote. You have the right to vote for important matters. Like you cannot vote for dividends. You cannot vote for cash dividends. You can vote for stock splits because it affects the price. You can avert a vote for a merger or a takeover. But the big one is you're voting for the board of directors. Not the chairman, not the CEO, not the CFO, the board of directors. And I think they come up every three years or so. Um... Like, I thought the rule was every third, a third has to come up every year, so that would mean every three years. Um, but here's the way it goes. There's two types of methods. First of all, you are always going to get one vote for every share you own. Again, you're going to get one vote for every share that you own. Okay. Now, depending if it's statutory or cumulative. Statutory means you get one vote for every share you own, per board seat, okay? So if you have 100 shares and three board seats, you get 100 votes per board seat, and that's the way you have to use them. If you decide not to use that vote, you lose it, okay? Good. Now, cumulative, better for the smaller investor, the minority investor, better for the smaller investor. Here's what happens. Same thing, three board seats, 100 shares, you're going to get 300 votes. See how I said it differently? You're going to get 300 votes to use whichever way you want. Say you really like this one. You know, this one is very pro-dividend. You can put all 300 votes on that one person. But then you don't have the other votes to spread around to the other ones. You use them all on one. So cumulative, you get to mix and match. Statutory, you use them where you got them. Cumulative, you can put them all on one person. You can even put 150, 150, and nothing for the third. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. Okay. My old teacher called it the Burger King method. Have it your way. Okay, so now, again, statutory is normal. It's just everyone. Cumulative gives the minority investor more voting power. Not more voting shares, more voting power. You have the right to receive a dividend. You're not guaranteed a dividend, but you have the right to receive a dividend. That is like getting a little bit of money, little profits, Okay. So, so here's the funny part. So you can get a cash dividend. You can get stock. You can get stock of another company. We'll explain that. And you can get product, which would piss me off. Like, you get Gillette, you get a bunch of razors. Okay. Cash is easy. You get a cash dividend. You receive a dividend. That's where, if you remember my acronyms from the other things, and I think they go into it later, but I'm going to do it now. DERP. Okay. So DERP is the order. Declaration X Record Payable. I think chapter 13 goes into the date, so I'm going to save it for that. But a cash dividend, you get a ca you get cash. But understand, on the X day, which is the day before the record date. Ooh, I'm trying to lead into that. Um, the day before the record date, they drop the price by the, by the amount of the dividend. So you do not want to tell your client, hurry up and buy it before the X day so you get the dividend. Because it does, it's, one is called selling a dividend, and it's wrong. So what happens is we have X day, then we have Coom date, Coom, very Latin. So we have Coom date, which is the day before the X date. Coom means with, and X means without. 
like ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend. So remember, kum and ex. Kum means with. I have to be very careful how I say that. So if you look it up, you'll see why. And then there's ex-dividend, which is, means without the dividend, which is the day before the record date. Not before the declaration date, not before the payable. It's the business day before the record date. I can also get stock. I, they can give me more stock. Say I own 100 shares at 50, and they give me a 10% stock dividend. I now have 110 shares, but the price drops down to like $45.45, so it's all even. There's no real gain or loss on this. I just have more shares. Then we have the uh, stock of another company. How this works is, say Pepsi has a, dist a food distribution, which they do. Did you know, and I didn't know this until I was like maybe 30 years ago. I was in college delivering pizza. Pepsi owns Pizza Hut, Frito-Lays, Taco Bell, all that stuff. I think it's Frito-Lays. But um, they have a food delivery. Back then, Pepsi was all one big company, and they did the food delivery stuff. I mean, they handled it under their company. Now, come like the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, they spun off their food delivery thing into Yum! Brands, which you may have heard of. So Pepsi, say Pepsi was trading at $50 a share, and you own one share of that. They spun off Yum! Brands, and they said, okay, anyone who owns Pepsi will get one share of Pepsi, like they have, but will also give them one share of Yum! Brands at 25 So what happens is you own one share of Pepsi at 50 now you own one share of Pepsi at 25 and one share of Yum! Brands at 25 Same value, but it's a spin-off, okay? So, but that's like the stock of another company. Third, fourth, I can't count, uh, product. That's like if a company gives, like, say they want to try a new product, they can send it to their shareholders. I would be pissed if I got it. But prior to Internet, when I was 16, I bought shares of Playboy, hoping, but nothing happened. Okay, now, right to evidence of ownership. So this is saying you have the right to say, look, your name's on the books. You're an owner. Yay. That's not really a right, but they list it here. Okay. The right to freely transfer, we spoke about this on my last episode. Ooh, episode, I sound so important. So, episode, uh, the right to transfer is the ability to get in and out very easily without having to go through paperwork. You buy IBM, and two minutes later you want out, you can sell it. That's actually a very valuable right. Now, okay, if, if you own... If you're a restricted person, usually it's like if you're a if you're an owner or a partner, officer, director. When a company does an IPO, a lot of times they'll set up. This is not a FINRA rule. This is company rule that they will uh, put a lockup period on it. Okay, so they will call these shares restricted, and they will be able to have a lockup, like they'll say six months or anything. Like when Facebook first went public, Zuckerberg says, and it was dropping. He goes, even after the lockup, I'm not selling my shares. It was a vote of confidence that he want, that he's all in. Which is fair, the stock took off, and I wish I owned some back then. Now, so restricted shares in this case, usually if you see restricted shares, that means there's a lockup of some sort, whether it's six months or a year or whatever it is. Okay. Now, Rule 144. So Rule 144 is for restricted, it, basically it's about the sale of restricted securities and control securities. They're different. Restricted securities are usually shares. Well, wow. Rule 144 governs risk restricted securities and control securities. Okay, so restricted are shares that are sold outside of the Act of 33. The Act of 1933 is how you register shares. I don't think we've done that yet. We did a little bit. Now, control is like for partners, officers, directors, and 10% owners. I call them the pods. Partners, officers, directors. They have control. Usually control shares have no holding period. Remember that. Usually control shares have no holding period, okay? They just don't. That's not their thing, but they will have some sort of restriction. Restricted shares usually have some sort of holding period, whether it's six months or something. That's if, like, it's a Reg D or Reg A. Sometimes they have holding periods on them, depending, which we'll go into more later in the book. Now, when you sell shares that are subject to Rule 144, you have to notify the SEC a, that you're selling them, and you fill out a Form 144. And dur if there's a volume restriction, there will be they will it will be for a 90 day restriction, which again we're doing more later. Um, I think I think it is coming later, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. 
So now the other thing is, if you're a control person and you don't want to follow these restrictions, you can ask you what they call the de minimis. De minimis means not a lot. Okay? Um, de minimis means not a lot. And oh, so, uh, so I'm big and fat. I'd be de maximis. So, so now, I shouldn't try to joke. I'm not that funny. So if you are a control person and you want to sell shares without filing a 144, what you would do is you would just fill out, now you don't have to fill out anything. Yet. As long as the, you don't sell more than 5,000 shares with a value of 50 grand. So if you sell four shares, like of Google, if you sell shares of Google, it's so expensive that it might be over 50 grand, even if you're not selling the 5,000. So you, if you sell 5,000 shares or less, that's worth 50,000 or less, you do not have to worry about the form. They figure it's such a small amount, who cares? I could use a 50 grand, but I guess they're saying it's not that big a deal. Now, if you are a control person, they put a volume restriction. And I love this. It's so easy. Rule 144, there's a volume restriction. 1%, you can sell the greater, the greater during the 90-day period. So again, let's since I made it confusing, if you're a control person, you have a restriction on how many shares you can sell during any 90-day period. And the way they do it is you fill out the form and they go, okay, you can sell the greater of 1% of the outstanding or the past four weeks trading volume. Again, you can sell the greater of the 1% of the outstanding or the past four weeks trading volume. I love this. Watch. So, so 90 days happens four times a year. Okay. So one, four, four is the rule. So it's 1%, one, four weeks trading volume, four times a year. One, four, four. That's how we remember this shit. Okay. Next classifications of stocks. Okay, so let's talk about this. A lot of people have problems with this, okay? So blue chips, that's the shit. They're the good ones. They're pretty damn safe. They usually pay dividends. Unless it's a blue chip growth stock, then they don't. But blue chips are like they usually have dividends. They've been making money every every month for years and years and years. They're the top. Like if you think of the Dow Jones, those are pretty much all blue chip stocks. Then we have growth stocks. Growth stocks are like they're newer, they're funner, they're fancier. They take their money and reinvest it in dividends, so they're not paying you. They have what they call a high PE, price to earnings. They're basically, you're gambling on them. I mean, they're not that risky, but they're riskier because it's more of a smaller company. And a lot of times they retain their earnings. Oh, retained earnings is dividends, is earnings not paid for dividends. So they retain a lot of earnings, very high retained earnings, very low dividends that goes together. And they are a little risky. You're looking for a better than aggressive, better than, better than average return. So it's more for aggressive investors. Okay. Defensive stocks. Right now, if, if you're watching this pretty much when I publish it, you would love defensive stocks right now. We're right now in the, uh, in the hell of the coronavirus sell off. Okay. Percents every day, which means the VIX is very high. Volatile markets, VIX is up a little aside. Defensive stocks are like tobaccos, pharmaceuticals, stuff like that. So think of it this way. This is what I tell everyone. Everyone needs to smoke. Everyone needs to drink. Everyone needs to eat. Everyone takes drugs. And I think that's it. Is there another one? I can't remember if there's another one. So it's pharmaceuticals, tobacco, alcohol, and food. God, I know there's an Oh, and utilities. You got to see what you're doing. You got to have the gas and the lights on. So it's utilities, pharmaceuticals. Tobacco, alcohol, and food. All those things are needed. So even in a bad economy, those will stay the course. They're not good in a good economy because they're underperforming. But in a bad time like this, they're the staples. They don't really drop that much. Okay. Income stocks. These are stocks that pay high dividends. Higher than average dividends. Usually like um, like a utility company or something basically is that pays a lot of dividends. You're not looking for capital appreciation. Okay, this is more for older people. Utility stocks are big, stuff like that. Blue chips, they can be. That's what it is. They're pretty safe. Okay, and they're looking for people who are looking for income, not growth. Cyclical, those are like the ones that run with the cycles. Economy's going up. They're rocket science. The economy's going down. They shit the bed. So remember, cyclicals go with the economy. Economy's good. Economy's bad. Economy's good. They do great. Economy's bad. They do horrible. Okay. But, they, but they're basically awesome for on an upward cycle, and then you get out of them before they drop, okay? Like appliances, steel, construction, automobiles. Those are things that kind of, you know, go with the economy. Like 
The economy is going well. People buy cars. People build houses. They'll buy, you know, washers, dryers, and stuff like that. Then they don't have it listed here, but counter-cyclical, it moves opposite. Like when the economy is bad, they do well. Not like defensive, which is just a signal. These actually do better in a bad economy. And one of the big ones is a pawn shop. Because when people don't have money, they sell their shit for money. That's why those pawn shows are great. A uh, pawn. Um, another one is uh, car repair. So bad economy, people are not buying new cars, so people just kind of extend the life of their car. A little bit. Okay. Hope that helps. Now, ADRs. This is the last one I'm going to do, and then next one I'll do, but preferred. ADRs are foreign securities trading here. So let me explain this. So an ADR is like British Petroleum trading in London. Yeah, you can open a brokerage account there, buy the shares, but no. What we're going to do is you're going to you're going to have an ADR. You like British Petroleum over there for some reason. You go and you look, and they see on the exchange, BP ADR. What that is is Fidelity or some big brokerage company, maybe Direxion, bought shares of British Petroleum, packaged it, packaged it, and put it into a package, and then sold this on the exchange. So what they do, it gets a packaged product. You buy like 50 shares of, of, you know, you buy a lot, but you break up the British Petroleum into lots of 50, and then you sell that as a shell, a package, on the U.S. Stock Exchange, or the New York Stock Exchange, or, or whatever, or over-the-counter NASDAQ, stuff like that. So an ADR is a foreign security packaged and trading here. So the foreign security does not register the SEC, but the ADR does, because the ADR is trading in the U.S., and it represents a foreign security. So, okay, guys, um, if you've made it this far, please hit like, subscribe, and go from there.